yeah, welcome and I think uh, thanks also to the organizer Antti. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor that we are, let's say, pre-opening this, this micro apps. Uh, there's, I think, afterwards the officially uh, opening speech. Um, what we are doing is we are talking here today about uh, something new which was made partially public, uh, which is done a project which Infineon is doing together with uh, Google AdHub. And uh, we have here also Jamie, she will speak in the second part. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you here from, from US, California, uh, about this system. And uh, what is this all about? Uh, I'm talking here about uh, new possibilities to use uh, this millimeter wave, 60 gigahertz in this case, uh, for sensing applications and technologies. Uh, split it, as I said, I will talk more about the hardware, which is the part of uh, Infineon. And then uh, Jamie will talk about more the software part and algorithm and all these uh, interesting things. So I split this uh, into four topics, uh, mainly about what possibilities and this means also what kind of uh, applications uh, this can be used for. What are advantages because you might know or several of you for sure know there are other possibilities to do this um, not with radar or let's say 60 gigahertz radar. Uh, then about this project itself, short summary, um, how we implemented this and um, what plans we have for the future because for sure this is a first step and uh, more possibilities to come and to summarize it. If you look into this, um, this application, ah, okay, no, unfortunately it's coming up everything. Um, the radar is mainly coming as m uh, most of you might know from automotive applications where uh, also Infineon is playing role but also other players are here. Um, and uh, automotive radar set is used already in the meantime in uh, millions of cars and it's really growing a lot. And uh, this was also the, let's say, base when we started this uh, cooperation about applications. But here we are talking something different as you see here. I mentioned here on the left side this level sensing, uh, industrial and home automation. Um, others would say this is a kind of uh, with this buzzword Internet of Things, IoT. Yeah? Because um, this automation, for example, usually is discussed, especially here in Europe, Germany under Industrial 4.0, Industrie 4.0 in German. Um, you have shown there also then lighting um, applications. All of them, uh, as well as outdoor automation um, and home appliance, or home automation, uh, which also used under the term smart home. All of them today are already using some kind of sensors or using sensors with uh, different technologies. Um, these technologies which are currently used could be passive infrared, uh, different light sensors, ultrasonic, um, and various kinds of said, uh, lights areas. Uh, what we are showing today is, that ba is based on the radar principle, which we explain also a little bit more during uh, the session. Um, and the main thing of this one, what we are uh, demonstrating and showing here today, is about gesture sensing and uh, presence detection. Um, the main thing here, the difference is that with this technology, you can differentiate much smaller uh, actions and this is coming as said from this principle uh, the advantage here from the radar sensor in this case compared to to others that this is more undependent from the environment so you have also other sensors which are using usually uh, capacitive set also information or light um, and sound and this is usually has an issue with the environment. For example, if it's very loud or if there's a lot of light already, it has its limits, which radar don't has. And radar has on top, that's why it's, for example, also used already in the automotive car industry, uh, the advantage that it's independent usually of the weather. For sure, not completely independent. So moisture, dust, snow, um, this can distinguish and uh, doesn't hurt. Um, and on top, it can be implemented also in uh, in some material 
where it goes through. For sure, there are also limitations, uh, especially if you talk about 60 gigahertz. Um, you know, there's a, in this frequency, especially there's a high path loss over the air. But this could also, in this case, even help or support this application because you're not disturbing uh, the neighbors or somebody else with this kind of sensor. Um, the advantage here is that due to this high frequency band is that you have a quite very high resolution. And this resolution technically comes from the bandwidth. The frequency band which is used here is uh, the so-called V-band, the unlicensed band, uh, which is today in most regions or countries 57 to 64 gigahertz. Um, as you might know, just a side note, uh, the FCC is discussing already or released pre-released also even a bigger band up to 71, but currently this is based on this uh, release which is unlicensed in most countries, let's say 57 to 64 gigahertz. This means you have seven gigahertz uh, bandwidth and with this bandwidth you are able to have this high resolution. So it's given by the bandwidth and uh, how it's used then for. Um, to be quite accurate there, I said with a radar, I said also in this case, what you can measure is usually the distance between objects, the speed, and uh, the angle um, in, in this environment. So with these three features, which are then also used, I said later in, beside the, uh, the RF portion, the RF product, the sensor itself in the further application area, you can then distinguish and get uh, this this information out and process this further in the uh, processing Unix or the pipeline, which Jamie talks a little bit more in, in detail about this. The other thing is, due to these high frequencies, um, you have there a quite short wavelength because if you if you look at 60 gigahertz, you have roughly five millimeter of wavelength. And this is the other thing which uh, has an advantage here, which allows you to integrate uh, the antennas because usually you have the antennas somewhere outside. Um, and with this possibility of this high frequency and small wavelength, you can integrate this uh, into a package. What uh, we are doing here in this case uh, to miniaturize the whole solution. If you look at the project itself, as I said, um, the project, which it's called Soli, and uh, several of you might have seen this already, it was published first time 2015, also in YouTube. Uh, there's another slide behind, but, but this is not animated, but uh, maybe Jamie shows it later. There's a YouTube video, which you still can see from 2015, but also a new one, 2016, where the principle of this radar is shown and how this uh, radar signal which is transmitted and reflected from the transmission uh, transmitter and receivers of our uh, solution there is then further processed in this uh, let's say pipeline later in the application processor and processed. Um, Infineon was, uh, was focusing currently as I said on the hardware side means mainly the chip development and the firmware uh, related to this to extract the raw data from the uh, radar signal and uh, that here we developed then several boards, which you later also can see at our booth, uh, and several chips related to this together with said Google Adhab. And uh, said Google is then uh, mainly was working on the algorithms, software, and processing of this um, on their side, which we explained I said in the second part. And uh, on top you have usually then the application layer where you distinguish which kind of application you want to do there, which kind of use cases I said before uh, with all this, it's a kind of IoT application as well as gesture um, recognition in some small devices which are usually called them wearables. Um, and this we also can, we will show later also at our booth, one of these wearables is a smartwatch which is using this technology as a prototype. So these are currently prototypes, but I will come to this later also in some of my slides. So about this uh, project, I said what Infinity was mainly doing there 
is working on the hardware and firmware and developing uh, several uh, boards to adapt this to the needs of the application. Uh, this is mainly coming, I said, from our radar knowledge, uh, from the, also from the experience we had there in the automotive, but also in the communication uh, industry. And uh, we provided there, I said, uh, several boards for this uh, to understand what are the requirements. What are the main things we have to do there is, uh, it's not just, let's say, the chip design, said in this case we also integrated the antenna, so we have also there the expert to do antenna designs. In this case, that integrated into the package, the package itself. Of course, important at these high frequencies is um, the co-development of the chip and the package itself. Uh, there's a lot of relation uh, which could have at these high frequencies a lot of interference or disturbance and you don't get uh, what you expect uh, in, a, in that way. So this is a co-design of the package and the chip. And Finian has there um, still the possibilities and all the options in-house. So we have our own factories for the chip development for, and the same for the package development. So that firmware I mentioned already and system design, for sure this is, was a discussion and is a discussion still together with Google Ad Hub. And last but not least, and I think this is a very important thing, you can do a lot of research and um, a lot of developments for sure in, in the universities, which are important and necessary. But at the end, if you want to bring a product to the market, you need to know how to test it. Because if, uh, if their yield, how we call this, is low at the end, uh, you have an issue that either your our costs are getting too high or the end customer will say, okay, what should I do with this? Because most of the parts are failing. Yeah? So therefore, this is one important thing which we learned and, and uh, have already in several products implemented, uh, how to test this in our factory so that hopefully you have close to zero failures. For sure, this is always a target coming from the automotive, but this is one of our targets from the company. To have hopefully no failures and uh, field returns. If you look now into this uh, project, I said it was started uh, in 2014, so two years ago roughly, uh, where we, as I said, reused our radar knowledge and this was a quite huge, I don't have it here, quite huge box like this. Um, but that time there was then discussion how to develop this. Um, and then we did the first board and chip tape out, so this one which we received uh, after discussions there how to do this in March last year uh, and do, did the first board. Um, this is this, this board here, uh, which is shown there. Um, what we did there, uh, first uh, we didn't have this in a package because as I said, this is another challenge, how, which package to use and to bring into this. So it was so-called uh, bear die. Um, the advantage if you bring this into packages that you can uh, assembly this then in your standard uh, tools in your factory as you're doing with other products, SMT. Um, I said the second step was then to bring it into a package, as shown here. Uh, I will show this also a little bit bigger later, so I'll explain this more. Um, and then it was shown also at the so-called Google I.O. conference. This was in May uh, last year. Um, the first demonstration set, which you can also see on YouTube. Um, so roughly one year later, or exactly one year later, uh, we de developed then a next generation of the of the chip. Here it looks quite similar, but uh, in detail it's, it's quite different. Um, the main differences, as I mentioned here, um, is the power consumption, which for sure in IoT and wearable devices is very important. Um, we started here at that time with more than one watt, and here we are in the range of uh, below 100 milliwatts. Yeah. So there's a magnitude from here to here in between, uh, for sure in the sensing mode. So, and beside this lower power, we also integrated even more functionality. Uh, here I will show next slide, and reduced on top the size by optimizing this, this whole design in terms of antenna and chip development. If you look now, I said a little bit more into this 
latest chip development and I said have here a sample. Oops. Sample of this. But you can see later at the booth. So this original size is roughly um, 8 by 12 millimeter, including the antennas integrated. Uh, I said it includes two transmit antennas, these are here, and four receive antennas. Um, this is our internal name of Infineon. We give there also names like other semiconductor companies called BGT60, transmit or receive uh, 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 24, oh no, there's an even a mistake, 60B. Uh, and uh, it has a bandwidth set of six, uh, seven gigahertz. This for sure is still uh, in some countries also a topic and there was a discussion also with um, FCC about this, where this is allowed to be used. Um, there are certain applications already allowed and these are in this case uh, under the uh, short range devices applications where this is released for, for this uh, use cases. Uh, set, according to this, it's possible to have a resolution of two centimeters. So this means you can distinguish two centimeters. This means in this range, which is, I think, a little bit more if you do your fingers like this. But, uh, and uh, this is not a but, uh, what is then done, I said, uh, this is before the processing. With this processing, which I said, uh, will be explained the second part, we come to this millimeter uh, resolution. So it means really you can distinguish fingers, swapping fingers, and kind of 3D. So this is then the possibility after the processing. Before it's roughly two centimeters, is a cal physical calculation. And afterwards you come to this millimeter range where you really can distinguish, let's say, finger movements, which we also can show uh, later at our booth with an example. I said, we call this system a package because we have these, I said, the antennas and transmitter receivers here integrated. In this case, same number of antennas than transmitters two and the same number of, of uh, receivers, like antennas four. It also integrates beside all the RF functionality, which are uh, standard things like mixer, VCO, PLL, uh, uh, front end, also the IF uh, baseband and some uh, first analog digital converters for first conversion uh, before the post-processing. Um, has also some memory inside because we are there also uh, locking there some information from the signals received and give this uh, via SPI bus then this is up to 50 megahertz then to the processor which is coming afterwards. Um, the interface is a direct interface to the application processor and I said this is more once it comes to uh, production we put in there this testing functionality which we are using in our factories to test the RF functionality. For example, that uh, we're sure that we achieve certain noise figure, face noise and so on, which we could measure uh, in a certain way in our factory there. Um, on top, and this is functionality which can be used, is not, uh, or is, is an option to use beside the sensing functionality of the gestures. You can even communicate there over this, giving some data or information over the same IC. Um, as you might know, which is used, for example, in the uh, white gig, 60 gigahertz, as the main functionality. So there's also some possibility to use this here with the same device. If you look into the uh, sensor itself, I said, uh, there, I said before there are multiple channels uh, combined, transmit, receive. Um, we put there a certain array and distance that uh, the channels of the receive have a certain distance, in this case is uh, lambda, so that they are all in phase. Which is important uh, to use this functionality of digital beam forming, which we are using here. In this case, to uh, track this, let's say, the object and the signal. Um, and I said, with this integration which I explained before. Here's an example of a simple picture uh, which is done in the lab. Said to distinguish uh, distances here as an example with the objects of 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter. But this is a, let's say, a very simple one. Um, 
that we say you can do also micro gestures, but in the other applications you also can go we said for really uh, small gestures of, of millimeters uh, there. If you look now into the evolution, as I said, I was talking today about this uh, solution where we had the transceiver, antenna and package, ADCs, SPI, and some memory there. Uh, there was a version before said which was shown last year and this Google I.O. but not really public. Um, what you still need said from a complete system is uh, that you have usually some external microcontrolling and memory included. Then the main part is the application processor which you usually have in a device if this is uh, uh, devices that like a, like a watch or speaker or other IoT devices and for sure some power supply. Um, what I'm showing here, different colors are different wafer technologies, which is the uh, main thing which we are using said, to develop products. We are using from Infineon here our own said, uh, CJ, lithium germanium by CMOS. So this is a combination of CJ with CMOS, which uh, was developed uh, our company over several years and which is uh, now available. Uh, the main thing here is that uh, this technology said usually has a very high frequency and this is the maximum frequency roughly of 400 gigahertz and this is and could develop be further uh, to higher maximum frequencies. This is important because the higher you are going up with your operating frequency, so in this case 60 maybe a future even higher. Um, the more important is what is the maximum on transit frequency in your technology. The further, uh, this is a part, uh, let's say in a simple rule, the better your, usually your performance is at the edge of these frequencies and over temperature and so on. So therefore we choose currently for our RF developments uh, this by CMOS technology. Um, the other option for sure is CMOS, which is usually done in the microcontroller space, here yeah, I mentioned, uh, but also in RF, uh, mentioned technologies below 65 nanometers of the node, um, and below usually, as, as a general rule, um, these application processors are even in the smaller nodes, 28. But for sure, this these things can can change over time. How we see this, as I said, uh, what we are further doing is currently we have still a synthesizer or PLL outside to integrate this and further down the road there's also an option maybe in future even to integrate uh, one step further. Um, depending again that which technology you choose here of this choice. To summarize this, I said uh, what, what we have shown here with this radar technology in general is that we have quite good uh, track record there already over the past years, which is coming is that from the automotive radar, which is working either 24 gigahertz currently or 77 gigahertz range. So 60 is in between. Uh, and there are already many parts, I said roughly 20 million, and this is currently really increasing a lot in the market for this ADAS application. Um, so we are showing here that with this 60 gigahertz radar, you really can uh, do various applications as I explained before um, and the range I think this I have not mentioned before we see there which is possible is up to 15 meter currently uh, with this solution we have today um, and they are quite accurate and have a high resolution that down to millimeter after the processing uh, we integrated the antenna so the advantage here is for sure that it's smaller but on top comes also a uh, from the system solution advantage that you can use your regular FF4 boards. You don't need this uh, specific high frequency material, uh, which gives you another advantage in terms of the bill of material of a complete solution. So FF4 is usually much cheaper than specific millimeter wave material. Uh, we have this beam forming due to the multiple transmitter receivers. And uh, due to this, for sure, it's quite easy to integrate this and use this for various applications where we hope to find uh, very customers or interests to discuss this further. From here I would uh, then hand over, I said, you can visit us at the booth here, yes. at 146, 
uh, here in this area. Uh, from here, I would then hand over to uh, to Jamie for the second part. Hello, I'm Jamie Lian. I'm the lead research engineer for Project Soli at Google Ata. Um, I came to this project about two years ago when it started, and I came from a more traditional and specialized radar application, which was interferometric synthetic aperture radar for satellite imaging. So it's been very exciting to be involved and to witness this very rapid emergence of radar into the consumer space and for ubiquitous sensing. So I'm very excited to talk a little bit about that today. Project Soli was driven by a desire to build new and ubiquitous, very intuitive user interfaces. Interfaces that really capture the power of the human hand and the sensitivity and dexterity to manipulate fine tools. So we were based on this observation that such user interfaces are lacking in today's technology. Um, all of the gesture interfaces are based on very coarse and uncomfortable types of interactions. So we were interested in building a sensor that would be able to capture this type of very natural and uh, sensitive movements of the human hand and fingers. And we believe such applications to capture this sort of gesture interfaces include smartwatches, as well as IoT, so ubiquitous sensors. So we're interested in building these sensors that can be easily embedded into the environment and into various consumer devices. When we looked into the scope of uh, existing sensors, we found that there were several requirements in order to build such user interfaces. First, that they would be able to capture sub-millimeter motions of the human fingers and hands. Secondly, that they'd be able to sense through optical occlusion, so things like uh, overlapping fingers where cameras can't capture these types of movements. Third, that the sensor can track in 3D space. And in order to be um, embedded into various devices, it has to work through materials. It should be immune to various external lighting conditions. And finally, it needs to be small enough to be embedded into a watch or other consumer devices. So within the landscape of existing sensors for gesture technology, we found that the existing sensors, including capacitive sensors and cameras, were lacking across um, being able to cover all of these capabilities. And so we looked into a, the middle part of the electromagnetic spectrum for a new class of sensors, and this was radar, so operating in the radio frequency bands. And the beauty of radar is that it can actually provide all of these capabilities all within a very small package. So first, in order to get to there, we have to actually build something that is small enough. So that means shrinking down the radar into something that can be easily embedded into devices. And we actually rapidly iterated through several iterations of hardware prototypes. Um, these included various frequency bands, all the way from 5 gigahertz up to 60 gigahertz, where we eventually landed up. And our initial 60 gigahertz prototype was also not that simple. So on the left side, you see our first radar prototype at 60 gigahertz. It was about the size of a desktop, and it consumed over 30 watts of power. So our initial challenge was just to shrink all of that down into something that could fit into various consumer devices. So luckily, we had a very good industry partner working with us, and this was Infineon. So with their help, we were able to produce a radar chip um, over the course of 10 months from our initial prototype, which was the desktop size, all the way to the 60 gigahertz radar in, in package, uh, a single radar chip that included the full functionality. And these included, as Uwe said, um, radar receive and transmit antenna arrays on package, which means that you don't need to be a specialized RF engineer or antenna designer in order to use this sensor. It can be a drop-in solution that can be used across various devices. And that means that finally, um, we arrive at a scalable radar solution that can be easily integrated into various consumer devices. So uh, with this small form factor comes new challenges for radar sensing. In order to explain this, I'll talk a little bit about traditional radar tracking. Traditional radar techniques are very founded on this idea of spatial resolution, which means that within each spatial resolution cell, we count on only having a single coherent target, a single coherent reflection that can be easily tracked and rigidly, so it moves with rigid dynamics. 
But obviously, this is not feasible for the kind of very fine hand and finger gesture sensing that we're interested in, where you have multiple centers, multiple points of your hand are moving with very complex dynamics within very close spatial proximity to each other. In order to accomplish this with traditional radar techniques, we would need very, very fine spatial resolution. Uh, under FCC requirements and under the form factor of the antenna arrays, we can actually only achieve on the order of a few centimeters of spatial resolution. So obviously this technique would not be feasible for the kind of fine gesture sensing that we're interested in doing. And these are new constraints which haven't really been explored through traditional radar um, applications such as satellite imaging or in particular. Um, these are new brought about by the constraints of consumer electronics where size and power and uh, various consumer regulations by the FCC come into play. So in order to address this, we started from the radar target model. Instead of treating the hand as a single rigid and coherent object that moves with rigid dynamics, now we start to treat it as a collection of dynamic scattering centers, where each of these scattering centers are parameterized by its, by its motion, by its distance, and by its scattering characteristics. And in, instead of trying to achieve the spatial resolution necessary to resolve all of these scattering centers spatially, which as I said would require very large bandwidth and very, very fine antenna aperture, um, instead we take a very opposite approach. So the Soli paradigm is actually founded on illuminating the entire hand at once with a very, very broad antenna beam. So it's a completely opposite approach of very fine antenna beam width. And what we do is that we treat the received signal then as a superposition of reflections from all of these scattering centers. By operating at a very high pulse repetition frequency, so transmitting a periodic waveform at very high repetition rates, we can start to extract and resolve the various temporal variations in the signal over these very high frequencies. And using that technique, of using temporal variations in the signal, we can start to resolve the dynamics of various scattering centers and interpret these, these dynamics as gestures. So the way that we process the signal is within the two classic time scales of radar signal processing, in fast time within each pulse and in slow time from pulse to pulse. And the way that our pipeline works is that we, we process the received signal into a set of signal transformations. And what this does is that it abstracts away from the original raw radar signal, which is modulation dependent, into various hardware agnostic representations, which represent the dynamics of these scattering centers and help us to visualize and interpret what gesture is being performed. Uh, these signal representations are important to us, not just from the gesture perspective, but also to create a fully scalable solution in that it provides a sort of hardware abstraction layer for radar. And what this means is that the hardware and the modulation design can be independently optimized for your various applications and your operating environment. And the gesture sensing pipeline can stay agnostic to that and stay consistent across your various hardware types. And actually, across all of our hardware prototypes that I showed earlier, we've used the exact same gesture sensing software for each one. So to give an idea of what kind of information these signal transformation captures, uh, these are examples of the range Doppler signal transformation across hand gestures and across users. And you can see that the motion patterns that these signal transformations capture are consistent across the various gestures and from user to user. And that means that we can apply various uh, simple machine learning techniques in order to recognize and discriminate various gestures from these signal transformations. Similarly, if we look at another signal transformation, the microdoppler, you can see a similar consistency of patterns, motion patterns captured by the signal transformations, which are consistent from user to user and across different gestures. So within Project Soli, what we did is we built a signal processing and machine learning pipeline on top of the signal transformation layer. And what these do is that they extract features from the various signal transformations, feed these into very simple machine learning classifiers, which then interpret them into gestures that can be fed into the various applications. Uh, this is a, a visualization of what our signal processing and machine learning pipeline looks like all the way from the raw FMCW radar signal 
through the radar transformations, the signal transformations, to low dimensional features that are extracted, and finally the gesture label provided by machine learning. So this full API we provided along with a developer kit um, to the general public in October of 2015, and we will be coming out with the beta version of this dev kit in the near future. So our UI um, user interface and user experience team began to explore how to build uh, user interfaces on top of the sensing capability. So this is a very simple demonstration of some early, early prototypes that we built. Um, of course, with radar, you get simple presence detection. Is your hand above the sensor or is it not? This demo shows the capability of our signal processing and gesture recognition pipeline to track these very fine sub-millimeter finger motions. So here, simply by rubbing together your index finger and your thumb, you can see that this little ball is controlled with sub-millimeter precision. So you can see the sensitivity that's possible with 60 gigahertz millimeter wavelength. And now with machine learning, we can begin to interpret these very fine finger motions into gestures. So here you can see that this very fine flicking of the thumb is mapped to and used to scroll a menu. So we can go forward and we can go backward. And the beauty of radar is that it's such a rich sensing capability that you can build very rich and multi-dimensional user controls. So here by combining the finger recognition, the gesture technology with the ranging capability of radar, now we can have multiple virtual controls in space. So you can see that the hours was controlled at one distance and the minutes were controlled at another. And finally, we can remember that radar is not just a precision sensor, not just for a very precise finger motions, but also can enable very playful interfaces and that really capture the user's imagination. So a very important aspect of our work is how do we translate this very fine sensing capability um, into something that's a natural inter interaction language for consumers that they'll be able to adopt easily. So in order to do this, um, our UX team began to think about what kind of motions are intuitive and understandable. And they started thinking about devices that we use every day. So the motion that we use to control our everyday devices, such as a touch screen, have become so intuitive that we began to think, is the motion actually coupled to the object itself, or is it understandable even without the physical device? And this is a concept that we found uh, extended to various tools and controls, that the motion that is used to control tools actually contains the intent and the function of the tool, even if the, even if the physical tool itself is not there. So Project Soli is founded from the user interface perspective on this idea of virtual tools, on virtual controls. And what this means is that we can use these very fine motions, these finger motions that we showed previously Soli can detect, and communicate them and enable these virtual tools even when a physical tool is not there. So now we have a very intuitive gesture language that people can understand and that can be easily mapped to various user interfaces. The beauty of these tools is not only do they provide a very natural mapping to user controls, as I said, but they also provide, as a byproduct, a haptic feedback. So one of the criticisms of uh, gesture interaction languages previously was that you can't actually feel what you're interacting with. But now when your hand both embodies the tool and it also acts upon the tool, you can actually feel the interaction and the control that you're trying to enable. So these are some very early uh, concept videos that we produced, um, trying to explore how these virtual tools can be mapped to user controls. So you can see that various functionalities that we're familiar with in everyday life, such as map scrolling, um, changing the menu, these can be imagined and enabled through, through virtual tools, even when the physical dial or the physical um, button is not there. So our work in the past year has been actually translating these concept videos into working prototypes. Um, in the last three months, uh, about three months ago, at Google I.O. of this year, we demonstrated two working prototypes. First, a speaker that we produced with uh, Harman, 
and I'll play this again. So here we found that the ranging capability of radar can be used and mapped to this light feedback in order to guide the user into the interaction zone where then they can turn on and off the radio using a simple gesture. And with the developments in hardware power consumption, size, and form factor, um, we were able to embed for the very first time a radar into a smartwatch. So here, all of the processing is done in an embedded processor. And uh, once again, we have the ranging capability of radar, which is now mapped to additional functionality, which we call a progressive reveal of information. So as you bring your hand in closer, you begin to see more and more information revealed to the user. And once they reach the interaction zone, um, you can begin to control your interface using these very simple virtual tool gestures that I explained before. So this working prototype we will show at the Infineon booth later today. I'd like to close by saying that um, we found through Project Soli that the opportunities and the challenges that we encounter with bringing radar to consumer devices are only just beginning to be explored. Um, we're very excited about all the potential that Project Soli and other radar applications can bring. So I would encourage you to please check out our website and um, Thank you.